Okay, we are live. Um, peace and blessings be uh, with you. Uh, I am daughter of Christ and we're here with our, our beloved brother Osama. Um, we are very happy to have him again. Uh, welcome everyone. Hope you can hear us and hope we can see the image of our brother here and my logo. Uh, we are here to talk about uh, Moses in Islam, in the Quran, and whether this is the real Moses or not. Uh, our sister Hatun is in the background. She has some internet issues. She'll be guiding us as much as she can. Um, and um, just a few um, a few things for the people in the chat. Hello, guys. God bless you. If you want to address our brother with any questions, please put at DCCI Ministries so we can see your question. Uh, and uh, we will be picking up some of these comments and questions later. Brother, hello. Peace of Christ be with you. Hello, my dear sister. How are you doing? God bless you. It's good to be with you and with all our wonderful audience. I hope and I pray that this will be a golden opportunity uh, for Christians to strengthen their faith in the biblical teaching and the biblical writing concerning the account of Moses and for our dear Muslim friends that they will have a waking uh, moment that uh, they will wake up and they uh, uh, realize that they are following a false prophet in a false cult, uh, a uh, ungodly cult, which is Islam. And I hope this uh, study of Moses, which have nothing to do with any doctrine, really, is just we're examining what the Quran teach about Moses compared to that which Moses wrote by his own hands in the pages of the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. So this is my heart and my prayer that our dear Muslim friends will not see that we're here to mock the Quran or to mock Muhammad or belittle Islam, but to expose what is written in such story, uh, which is written throughout the pages of the Quran. So what do you think, brother, about the Muslim account of the story of Moses? Well, we are just started. So we only did one broadcast last uh, two weeks ago. And uh, uh, as we found so far that most of the Quran, most of the stories of the Quran is written in the same style of that study of Moses. We have done uh, last year a study on Joseph and we discovered that Joseph is the only story in the Quran which is written in one chapter. I know there is one reference outside of chapter 12, but the account of Joseph, which is written in one location in the Bible, Genesis 36 to the end of the chapter, uh, the last chapter of the book of Genesis, in the Quran, Muhammad put it in one location, which is, which is Quran chapter 12. He named it Joseph by the same name of the character Joseph. But when we go to the rest of the stories, if it is Adam, if it is Noah, if it is uh, 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 Abraham, if it is uh, Moses, if it is David, if it is Solomon, different names which Muhammad copied their account from the Bible and made them his stories of the Quran. Muhammad did not do what he did with Joseph, which means to understand Moses, you actually have to go throughout all the pages of Bible. Some of them are Mecca verses and others are Medina verses. And it's not like you're reading a little bit, a little bit more, a little more. No, 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 no. A little bit of the story of Moses. And then he repeated by taking some of what he said out, add a little bit in, or sometimes he just repeats the same thing with a little bit of information, nothing new. So it is, as you read in my English translation of the Quran, you will see the statement which we always have uh, before each one of these progress when we talk about Moses. The story of Moses repeated once again, once again, and once again. This is the reality, how Muhammad wrote to his Muslim readers the story of Moses. Now, we discovered in our last program, which is the first program, and I hope if somebody missed it, he did not or she did not see it, please go back and watch the first program. It will not hurt to watch it again and take notes. And uh, so we discovered that Moses is mentioned in the Quran over 100 times, a lot, 140 sometimes, I believe, whatever the number was, just his name. And you can learn nothing about Moses from all this passage, except that you will find out that Muhammad, or we can say Allah or Jibreel, do not know when Moses came to existence. Because sometimes they put the name before other prophets or other names, biblical names, or sometimes he put in the middle, sometimes he put in the end. That was the first thing we learned about Moses from the writings of the Quran. The second thing we found out, Moses' story written in two different styles. A style which we have just one verse, 
would, which literally have a little bit of information about Moses or sometimes four or five verses. And that's all what you're going to read in that specific surah in the Quran or a portion of revelation of the Quran because we know the word surah is a non-Arabic word which means a portion of revelation. And when you look at all these small passages of the Quran which talk about Moses, you will gain a little bit of information. Most of it will be chaos. Most of it will lead you to ask questions. And sadly, our dear Muslim friends, they will not find the answer for their questions about what in the world did Allah, Jibreel, or Muhammad is talking about. You cannot find it. It's, the answer is not there. But the Muslim will say, wait a minute, we got the biggest passages of the Quran where you learn about Moses in details. All what you need is there. And I will assure you, my dear friends, as we're going to look at this large body of language or large, uh, uh, large body of information, you will always face the reality. Not only the Quran contradicts the Bible, but the Quran contradicts the Quran. And many of these writings does not make any sense. And the beauty of that is when Muslims come back to you and tell you, no, 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 no. You see, you need to read the scholars' interpretation. Ibn Kasir, Al-Tabari, Al-Qurtubi, al, 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 al jalan these people are the ones who know Islam very well, and they are the ones who help us to understand Islam. And notice, we're going to be using in our study here only Ibn Kasir. And as we look at it, sometimes maybe I use Al-Tabari with different ways, but the majority of my writings in that chapter is Ibn Kasir. As a matter of fact, my whole two volume books which is exposing the truth about the Quran, the revelation in the entire title, I look at Ibn Kassir's writing, Ibn Kassir interpretation for these two volume books. So, 41 chapters. Majority of my work, 90 plus percent is Ibn Kassir. Unless when Ibn Kassir goes silent about specific passages, that, that's when I examine Al-Tabri or somebody else. But when you read the interpretation of Ibn Kassir, we as Christian and the Jews concerning the story of Moses, we know the real information beyond or behind what is written in the Quran, which is the Bible. Now we ask, we always will ask a question, where did Ibn Kasir come up with this knowledge? Did he receive this information from Allah? I mean, was Ibn Kasir another prophet who came hundreds of years after Muhammad, or was he simply reading the Bible, filling in some of the information which Muhammad and Jibreel and Allah forgot to copy from the Bible to the Quran? This is a very important question. So do not believe that Ibn Kassir is a scholar because he gives you more understanding to the account of Moses. No, 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 no. Ask the question, how did he know that? Where did he come up with this knowledge? If it is from the Bible, he is also following his prophet Muhammad by copying information from the Bible and inserting in the Quran. Without further ado, let's move on with our study today as we will be examining uh, the large body of information in the Quran which is written about Moses. Okay, so I've got here um, where we left off last time, brother. Yes, ma'am. The birth of Moses and killing of the sons of can Israel. You, can you go a little bit above that, if you don't mind? Can you go a little bit? Because I believe there's a program here I need to emphasize on if we can scroll up a little bit, my dear sister. If we can't understand, that's, that's okay. Uh, I think Sister Hatoon... Sister Hatun, can understand? you go up a little bit? Yes, that's good here. That's good. Notice, start from notice, uh, blah, blah. We will. How about we'll cover Moses' life? Start from that. Okay. Okay. Shall I read it, brother? Yes, ma'am. We will cover Moses' life as written in the Quran 28, but also draw on other versions of the story in Quran 7, 20, 26, and other portions of Revelation as necessary to complete the story or show conflicts in the stories. Additionally, we, we will compare these stories in the Quran with the biblical account of Moses in Exodus. That's very good. So my point here is, here is the four uh, large body of uh, material in the Quran. Quran chapter 28, Quran chapter 7, Quran chapter 20, and Quran chapter 26. These are the where we find the story of Moses in more just than two, three sentences. As you're going to see, we're reading lots of verses. Now, I'm not going to be able to compare all these uh, four location together but we're going to look at 28 and then once in a while you're going to see me mentioning 7 or 20 or 26 these are the four chapters we're going to be looking on uh, as we study the story of Moses so without uh, any more uh, waste of time let's go to the birth of Moses and the killing of the sons of the Israelites okay it says in Quran 28 Muhammad gave us the story of the birth of Moses according to verse 2 
Those are the verses of the clear book. This is not just a simple story, but part of Muhammad's support for the veracity of his revelation. This statement is found throughout the Quran as Muhammad repeatedly maintained that the words of the Quran are clear. Was he trying to deceive us because he was keenly aware of how truly unclear the words were then and would be to us? And, and, and it's a fact, my dear sister, and all those who are watching us right now, I do not know why in the world Muhammad put these words in the beginning of his telling of the story. Literally, as you continue to read the stories of the Quran or the writings of the Quran in general, Muhammad makes so weird, I mean, uh, unusual to say this is an Arabic book, clear mm -hmm. Arabic book. Excuse me. <laughs> I have read so many books in my life, which are obviously translated from other language or simply in English or uh, in Arabic language. And I never in all my life, I'm 53 years old, not once I read a book in Arabic, as I hold one here in my hand, Ta'liqat uh, al-Quran, okay? I never look at inside the book in the Arabic language and say, this is an Arabic book. <laughs> I mean, it's, it sounds weird to me that Allah will tell Muhammad to tell all the Muslim believers that the Quran is Arabic. Excuse me. تقديم الكتاب نقدم هذا الكتاب لخدمة الرب لاستخدامها الخاص you what? I'm reading Arabic the author of that book does not have to tell me hey by the way you're reading an Arabic book doesn't make any sense especially when I know when I study the Quran and I investigate the Quran as we have done here in my accurate translation of the Quran I discovered that 279 words in the Quran are not Arabic so why Allah is emphasizing that the Quran is Arabic when in reality it has so many foreign languages, foreign words of foreign language, like Hebrew, Greek, Syriac, Aramaic, Coptic, and other languages. So I'm sorry, there's no reason for Muhammad or Allah to tell me it's an Arabic book. If it is an Arabic, I'm reading Arabic. If you cannot read it, it makes no difference if you put in front of it it's Arabic or French. That's number one, clear. Why Muhammad always says, those are the verses of the clear book. The book is not clear. And the evidence is when we read it, we don't understand it. And if we need to understand it, we have to go to Muslim scholars interpretation. And when we read Muslim scholars interpretation, they always begin their interpretation by stating, interpreter disagree. Scholars disagree. Excuse me. How can this be a clear book? When your scholars are telling me that the scholars disagree about the meaning or the purpose or the reason why Allah sent these verses and these verses and these verses. If it's clear book, trust me, we do not need Ibn Kasir. We do not need our dear sister here or Hatun or Yusama Daktak or anybody to tell us what the Quran says because it's clear. But that's not the story. The story of the Quran is not clear. And we're going to prove it to you as we continue in our study. Go ahead, sister. What you said, brother, reminds me when he says, keep saying, oh, I'm not a liar in the Quran. He's not a liar. <laughs> Same thing. I think, you know, we have in Egypt this expression. I don't know if you guys know it or not, but the expression is, ala rasu batha yihassis aliha. Okay? If you have, a, if somebody hit you on your head and you have a, a pump, whoever have a pump on his head, once in a while, he put his hand and feel it. Without even thinking, you put your hand, oh, why are you doing that, Brother Yusama? I, I just hit myself and it's well here. That is exactly the story. Muhammad knows that he's a liar. Yes. Muhammad knows the Quran is not clear. Muhammad knows that people who help him to write the Quran are not really those who are excellent in the Arabic language. So there is non-Arabic words in the Quran. So what do you say? Well, you say, well, it's in Arabic. It's clear. It's easy to understand. No, it is not. Even when you read in the Quran, he said, he said, Muhammad himself, that some people said that some person helped him to write the Quran. And how Muhammad responded, oh, that's not true in the Quran. Why? Because that person is not an Arab. And the Quran is clear, Arabic, easy to understand. I'm sorry, the person who helped Muhammad was most, most likely a Syriac or some guy from uh, spoke the Aramaic language. That's why we see these many words in the Quran are found. That is exactly what the people accuse Muhammad of doing. Somebody is helping him, and yes, that somebody is not, does not speak Arabic as his first and only language, okay? So let's move on. Good point, sister. Uh, Quran 28, two to six, contains a description of the status of the land of Egypt under the leadership of Pharaoh, 
as he subdued the Jews who lived in the land by beheading their male children. Those are the verses of the clear book. We will recite to you some of the news of Moses and Pharaoh with the truth to the believing people. Surely Pharaoh exalted himself in the land and made its people into sects, weakening a group of them, slaughtering their sons and sparing their women. Surely he was of the vandals, and we desire to show favor to those who were weakened on the earth and to make them leaders and to make them the heirs and to establish them in the land. And we showed Pharaoh and Haman and the troops among them what they were fearing. All right, let's go a little bit off Sister Hatun, if you don't mind. I need to look at the whole passage of the verse. Notice here, notice here, to show that the Quran is not clear. How did Pharaoh kill the boys, the little boys, in according to Quran? According to Quran, the Quran said what? Pharaoh exalted himself and in the land made its people into sects, weakened a group of them, slaughtering their sons. I'm sorry. Pharaoh never slaughter a son. None of Pharaoh's people's slaughter is Zabh. Zabh is cut the head, separates the head of the body by cutting the throat off, completely out. That's mm -hmm. not what the Bible said. Muhammad made a booboo. Allah made a booboo. There is no slaughtering of sons. And then he said what? And sparing the women. What do you mean sparing the women? If you slaughter the son, you spare the girls, not the women. When a baby is born, that's not a woman. It's a little girl. So it, the, the logic of the writing of Muhammad does not make any sense. First of all, there's no slaughtering for sons. There was no beheading to the boys. And if you're going to behead the boys, that means you're going to save the girls, the little girls, not the women. That's a, just an honest mistake here, or a ridiculous mistake. Now, let's continue. What do you have after that? Um, and then he said, in verse uh, 4, uh, no, five is good to five. And we desire to show favor on those who were who are wicked on the earth or on the land. How? And make them leaders and to make them the heirs. Excuse me. None of the Hebrews became leaders in Egypt. None of the children of Israel became any leader. And they never inherited the land of Egypt. So... One of the big mistakes in the story of Moses in the Quran, as you realize this, as Muhammad keep repeating the story, that he think in his mind, first of all, Moses was sent to Pharaoh to lead him to Islam, to make him a good Muslim. That's not true. To make him believe in Allah, that's not true. Uh, and now because he refused, then Allah drowns the Egyptian and causes the Hebrews to inherit the land of Egypt. That's not true. The message of Moses was very clear. As a matter of fact, it's a very famous statement. Everybody almost knows in the West, those who watch the Ten Commandments movie. Let my people go. Moses was not interested to stay in Egypt. Allah and Moses, Allah is the God of the Bible, the true God of the Bible, was not interested for Moses to be a leader or some of his people to be a leader in Egypt or for them to inherit Egypt or to stay a day in Egypt. The message of Moses the mission of Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land. That's not what Muhammad understood. That's not what the Quran teaches. So, um, okay. Uh, blah, 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 blah. That's good. Go ahead, sister. Let, let's read now this passage. Okay, from that point out. Yes. This passage is in direct conflict with Moses' own account in Exodus 1, which records that the male children were not slaughtered as Muhammad said in the Quran, but were drowned. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Notice here, by the way, when we see the talex bold in my writing, that's biblical. When you see, uh, uh, that's how we do it, a little bit different to, to and the rest of my writing. So that is what is written in Exodus. Exodus, talking about Pharaoh's order. The boys to be drowned, Acts 122. The girls, uh -huh, the girls to be saved, not the women. Mm. Because they're not born to be women, they're little children. Maybe in Islam, when you turn six, you're a woman. No, but yeah, there's no difference. You're not a woman until you grow up to be a woman. All right. Yeah, yes, yes. Go ahead, sister. In Ibn Kathir's interpretation, he wrote that Pharaoh abused the children of Israel, causing them to do the worst and lowest type of work in the land although they were the best of people in the land. Let's stop it for a second. Did Ibn Kassir know what kind of works they were doing? 
No. Did Allah know what kind of work they were doing? No. Did Muhammad have a clue what kind of work they were doing? The worst work. What is the worst work? I mean, as a matter of fact, I don't see anyone in the Quran Allah asks the children of Israel to work. Or Pharaoh said that the children of Israel were doing any work. I challenge any Muslim, show me what is the work the children of Israel were doing. You can only understand that statement here, which is the work of Ibn Kasir, to interpret nothing written in the Quran. Can you imagine with me? There's no verse to interpret. What is interpretation? See, the basics of, of hermeneutics is unknown to the Muslims. It's unknown to their scholars. To interpret a verse, first, you must have the verse. First, you must have the verse. If you don't have the verse, you cannot interpret. And if you're going to write a statement about the verse that does not exist in the Quran, we say you are fabricating interpretation. Why? Because you don't have anything to interpret. How have you still come up with this statement? This is just logic here. They were doing the worst work in the land, even though they were the best people of the land. We don't even know who they are. Can you tell me who are these uh, people? Who are their ancestors? Can you give me the names of the early 72 fathers? When did they come to Egypt? How did they end there? See, we read the story of Joseph before, and we ended that Joseph, father and mother, came to Egypt, and, and Joseph made them in the highest place. He put them up on his throne, and that was the end of the story of Joseph in the Quran. When in reality, Joseph's mama had been dead for 30-some years. And when you read the Genesis account, you will read when, 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 uh, when, uh, when Jacob came to Egypt, Jacob and 71 sons, 71 of his children from his blood, these are the 12 sons and their sons came to Egypt. Not only were guessing the number, we know their names. You have to go back to the Bible and read. And these are the generation of Jacob who came to Egypt. And it started with Judah, Reuben, blah, blah, blah. And then in Egypt, we got Joseph, and we got Manasseh, and we got Ephraim. Two more sons. The total is 72. And the Quran, you don't even know who these people are. When did they come to Egypt? How long did they stay in Egypt? What they were doing in Egypt? And on and on. To understand the Quran, you need to throw it on the side and get the Bible and read the Bible. That's the only way you can understand the Quran. Ibn Kassir, trust me, will not help you. Al-Tabri, Al-Qurtubi, al jalari believe me, they will not help you. Here we go. Ibn Kassir, they, they were doing the worst work. Okay, Ibn Kassir, let's give you a, a, an easy quiz. Can you tell me, Mr. Scholar, what is that type of worst work he, he can do? And why they were the best people of the land? I mean, what? They have extra arm? <laughs> Their eyes is, is bigger? The women are more attractive and beautiful? What is that? I call fabrication to interpret verses is not in the Quran. Do you understand that? Go back. And by the way, we're not going to read the whole Exodus for you. And I hope and I pray each and every one of you, if you are a Christian, if you are a Muslim, if you are somebody searching for some beliefs, open that Exodus account. It is available online, whatever language you speak. If you are a guy speak Hebrew, it is there. Arabic is there. Syriac, I mean, whatever language, they're, they're, we have the Bible now in more language than you can even imagine. So open the Bible, go to the Exodus account, and be smart, investigate what I'm saying. Maybe I'm making a mistake. You think I am uh, Mr. Perfect? I'm not Mr. Perfect. My dear sister here, she made a comment or two, and she maybe make mistakes. How do we make mistakes? So what? Examine what we're teaching. If it is from, from Islamic side, go to the Quran. Go to chapter 20 and read. Maybe, maybe I made it up. I'm trying to make Muhammad look bad. I'm trying to make Islam look bad. I'm trying to make Ibn Kassir look bad. So I'm lying. Examine what we're teaching. And I'm thankful to the Lord because when we live in a time, no such time as this. Have I shared that program with you a few years ago. You would have never read it on the screen. Not only that, you would never have it to go back to it. So save that study on your own laptop, on your own computer, on your own iPhone, and examine everything we teach. If it is from the Quran, go back to the Islamic source. If it's from the Bible, go back to Genesis and Exodus and read. And examine. Find our false teaching. Because it will be an honor to me. It will be a great help from you to me that in between here and next week when we continue our study, that send me email. Brother Yusama, you made a mistake. You said blah, blah, blah. When in reality, when in reality it was blah, blah, blee. Or blah, blah, blue. I want to be smarter. 
How can I be smarter? You ask me hard questions. You examine my teaching and you correct me. I'm not a perfect guy. I just wrote the book. How? Because I studied and read. Maybe I missed something here or there. So let us help each other to be sharper. Muslims examine what we're teaching. So is Christians. All right? Is that the question to us. So obviously from that point until number seven here, where you get the reference for it in, on the bottom of my book, where I come up with this. Every, everything I wrote about Ibn Kasir, I reference in the bottom of the page where you know for sure that I, know, I did not make this up. Because hey, trust me, anybody can make up stuff. And so you summon that doc said, blah, blah, blah. Go search for it, you'll never find it. But thank God we have the source of this. The book is called The Beginning and the End, The Story of the Prophets by Ibn Kasir. I have it in Arabic, and we got the English in front of you. All right. So let's go after seven sister, if you don't mind. Yes, I don't mind. He says he he was killing their sons because the children of Israel were studying the belief they inherited from Abraham, that from his descendants a young boy would be born and would destroy the king of Egypt. This Excuse me, just me, just me, just me. <laughs> Listen to the imagination now. Not only he's trying to help us to understand things about Moses in the Bible and the, and Moses people in the Bible when they were making bricks. And they were working hard, and they have to make this amount of bricks which Pharaoh is using to build his cities. And we, now, we even in the Bible have in the Bible in Egypt we have the history, the history writing of the Hebrews in Egypt building cities for Pharaoh. So the Bible story for the atheists was oh, made up by Moses. No, we have the archaeological evidence that what the Bible said about the Hebrews making bricks out of mud. And, and, and straw, this is written in the Egyptian history, which has nothing to do with the Bible or God. We're not making this up. But as he continues to say, but he was killing the sons. Why he's killing the sons? Because the, 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 the Hebrew people were studying something about Abraham. I love about Abraham. Every single one of Muslim talk about Abraham. I mean, literally just uh, four days ago, me and my secretary were writing some material to the people of New Zealand to help them to the politician of New Zealand, to help them to save New Zealand from falling under the deception and the uh, invasion of Islam, of the Muslims. And in the article, the Muslim is writing, I'm, I'm writing to the government, and the Muslims are writing to the government, and the Muslims say, Abrahamic face. They use Abraham as a chewing gum. We all believe in Abraham. And they say, the beauty about Abraham face is, it is the faith of the monotheistic, People, the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims. So now that Muslim Imam or the Muslim doctrine, he have a doctorate degree, is bragging about Judaism and Christianity and Islam because we all follow Abraham, who has the belief of the must, uh, the, 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 one, the belief in one God. Excuse me. Do you think that's true? It's a lie. Even when I study the Quran or I study the Bible, I don't see Abraham to have his religion. And every Muslim knows that the Christians are not monotheistic. The Christians are polytheistic, which means they believe in more than one God. No one Muslim, that Imam who wrote these lies, he knows that Christian worship is three gods. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or according to the erroneous mistake of the word of Allah in the Quran, Father, Mother, and Jesus. So why is he lie? Because that's the reality. They love to lie. Let's go back to the point here. He was destroying the sons. He was slaughtering, beheading the sons because these Hebrews were studying something about, about Abraham. What about Abraham? Oh, that there will be a son. There will be a male, one of the children of the, of, of the, of the Hebrews. That male children will be the one who will kill the Pharaoh. Wow. I wonder where is that in, in any of the writing of the Old Testament? He's going to be killed with one of the male. So that's why Pharaoh is so smart now. They have to understand. Pharaoh, that king, the man who built the pyramids, the man who made the, who has the best doctor to do the mummification, the engineers, and study of uh, uh, of the sun and the moon and the stars. That these smart Hebrew, smart, uh, smart Egyptian, the Pharaoh, figured this out. So that's why he decided to go ahead and kill the baby boys because now the Jewish people are studying this material from Abraham and he want to end it before he is ended. So he's going to kill the ba baby boys so that he himself will not be killed by one of them. Makes sense. Okay, let's keep reading. So what happened because that? Um, then it says... Uh, In contradiction... This 
Oh, okay. In contradiction to this, Ibn Kathir stated that the Egyptians complained to Pharaoh that the shrinking number of male Israelites decreased the number of available workers. Therefore, Pharaoh issued a new command to kill their male children on alternating years. Well, let's stop it for a minute. Different story. <laughs> no, it's, it's just that. You see, this is just stupid. Pharaoh, okay. listen, listen, my dear sister, listen. Pharaoh knows. The reason he was killing the boys, because one of them, all I think is one of them will fulfill the study, which they learn from Abraham. And that one, when you grow up, is going to kill the Pharaoh. Now the Egyptian complained. Remember, these Hebrews were doing some work. We don't know what it is. And it was a dirty work, even though they were the best people of the land. Okay. So they said, oh, Mr. Pharaoh, yes. King Pharaoh, we have a complaint to you, sir. Yes. We don't have enough males. You don't have enough males to do the work, and now we're gonna have to do that dirty work. Uh, can you fix it, please? Sure, I can fix it. Uh, you know what? In the odd years, we're gonna let the baby the babies grow. In the dual years, we're gonna kill them. So in the year 2001, the baby is born, will be alive. 2002, we're gonna kill them. 2003, we'll keep them alive. 2004, we're gonna kill them. You got the idea? What a stupid pharaoh. If he will do that, all it takes is one boy to grow up, not 50, not 100, not 1,000. One boy to grow up, and he will kill the Pharaoh. You see the stupidity of Pharaoh? Or maybe we say the fabrication of Ibn Kassir. I'm sorry. Ibn Kassir, you made this up. There is no such a thing. Pharaoh kills him in one year and, kept, and, and, and uh, saves their life another year so he can have enough workers. Maybe Mr. Ibn Kassir like all my dear Muslim friends, need to read the Exodus account to know the true story, not the fabricated story by Ibn Kassir. Continue, sister. Number eight, after number eight. Therefore, it was said that Aaron was born in the year when they allowed Israelites to have sons, while Moses was born in the year that they killed the male children. Oh, now it makes sense. You see? Ibn <laughs> Kassir was color. The man is a smart I wrote about Ibn Kassir in that book here, and I confess it, I said it before I say it again. I wrote, Muslim scholars are Muslim dumbers. And when I said that, my editors, all of them, three or four of them, or total of Usama, you cannot use the word dumbers. I said, why not? They said, that's not an English word. I said, I made it up. And it's in my book. It's written in ink. We will need to add it to the dictionary. It's true. Ibn Kassir is not a scholar. al is not a scholar. None of your Muslim scholars are scholars. They're a bunch of dumbers. But they, I know it's not, still not a word. Just add it to your dictionary and put next to it is some adaptor. Invented by some adaptor. I can't take credit for it. They're stupid. They kept the babies alive. In the year where Aaron was born, Harun in the Arabic language. And the year where Moses was born, that's when he's supposed to be killed. Wow. The, now, now Ibn Kassir got the evidence to prove his point. When in reality... He is literally a dumber. Okay, move on. Does this make any sense? If the reason that Pharaoh was killing the Israelites was to kill the Savior, who would grow up to kill the king of Egypt, why would he let the sons born be born in alternating uh, alternating years live? Was the king of Egypt as foolish as Ibn Kathir? This is contradicted with what is written in Quran 7, 1 to 7. And the leaders from the people of Pharaoh said, Will you let Moses and his people to vandalize in the land and desert you and your gods? He said, we will kill their sons and spare their women, and surely we are dominant over them. Now we have the biggest problem. The Quran, not only the Quran contradicts the Bible, the Quran contradicts the Quran. Why is that? If the fear, if the people of Egypt are speaking to Pharaoh about let the children of Israel vandalize in the earth. I mean, vandalize in the earth. Muhammad used this word everywhere. And I have no idea how these Hebrews were vandalizing in the earth. I mean, how, what they were doing wrong in the land of Egypt? They, 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 they did nothing wrong. It is a word Muhammad used all over the country without even understanding what he's talking about. You're going to hear it with Lot. You're going to hear it with Abraham. You're going to hear it with Moses. You're going to hear it with Noah. You're going to hear it with... Uh, and, and, and uh, I mean, everyone is vandalized by even, even for Muslims, those who engage in war against Allah and His Messenger. Quran chapter 5, verse 33, I guess. Uh, if I'm not, if I'm wrong, it's just 
the, the one before one after five certain strangers those who engage in war and uh, against Allah and his man and vandalize on the earth excuse me how can I engage in war against Allah when Allah I'm going to throw a rocket on him uh, shoot, a, shoot a, a, a bomb against Allah in heaven it is dumb writing verse but what is vandalization I don't know that word should be taken out of the Quran because there's no point of it because it doesn't make any sense but here we go will you let the Hebrews Moses people that you know what when the Quran say Moses people you know what it mean you have to be a grown up man not Moses family his little boy no Moses people the people of Moses so Moses a grown up man and the and the, the Egyptian would complain to Pharaoh about Pharaoh leaving Moses and his people to vandalize in Egypt and do what and desert you and your gods who the Hebrews never worship Pharaoh the Hebrew never worship any of the gods of Egypt that's reality that's why they were different than us. We worshiped every pharaoh. They were all our God. We love each one of them. We'll die for them, okay? But the Hebrews, when they came to Egypt, they did not, they did not worship the pharaoh or anything. So this is the reality how the Hebrews lived in Egypt for the 400 years, 430 years to be exact. By the way, the 430 years, you're not going to find in the Quran. And if it, none, none of Muslim scholars will repeat and say what it is because they don't know. The simple questions about Hebrews in Egypt, Muslims have no answer. When did they come to Egypt? Who, how many of them came to Egypt? Give me the names of these people who came to Egypt. How long did they stay in Egypt? How did they left Egypt? Muhammad and Allah and Jibreel do not know a jack. As my friend Adam Seeker always say about Moses. They know nothing. But anyway, so, so what did he say now? He repeats the same sentence which we read earlier in Quran chapter 20. 21-27. He, oh, he will go. He will fix it. He, what he's going to do? He will kill all the boys and keep the women. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now the question we must ask here, I think, I, I, if I wrote or not, I'll repeat it anyway. When did Pharaoh, according to the Quran, kill the babies, the sons of the Hebrews? When Moses was a baby or when Moses was a grown-up man and he is among his people? He was the leader of his people. No answer, trust me. My dear Muslim friends, when we ask questions in these broadcasts here, one second, it is not for the purpose of belittling your Quran or make fun of Allah and Muhammad and Jibreel. That's not my heart. My heart for asking this question is to speak to your mind, to speak to your understanding. You can fabricate answer for every question I'm going to give you. We did this with Joseph, and we almost asked 100 questions. Go back and watch Hatun programs. I did with Hatun on Joseph. 100 questions and you will not be able to answer one right trust me but if you want to belittle your own mind and fool your own self and your children and your grandchildren it's okay continue muslim continue believing the quran it is the perfect word of allah nothing wrong with it but if you're sincere with yourself and we hear my question you stop and think and find an answer it is not there Fabricate an answer, you continue Muslims. Be realistic with yourself. Be honest with yourself. You're going to say goodbye to Allah and Muhammad and Islam and you become a born-again Christian. It's not about adding one more Muslim to Christianity. It is freeing you and your children and your grandchildren. Break the tie to Islam. Break the chain of slavery. Submission mm -hmm. to Allah. Amen? Amen. So let's go continue, sister. What do we have after that? I didn't notice that one, brother, before about when he, they were killed, when the pharaoh wanted to kill them. That's amazing. It doesn't make like, any sense. It doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense because he says we will kill the sons. Yeah. But then before it said Aaron was born on the year they were not killed. And he, was, and he, he should, you know, if, if this, some Muslim would say, well, it, it happened twice. twice. <laughs> you know what? You know what pharaoh will tell his people? Excuse me, guys. I've been killing them for the last 40 years. You are the one who complain and tell me you don't have enough workers and I have to keep sounds of my life. What do you, make up your mind. Do you want to do the worst work or do you want me to keep some of the Moses people? Yeah. If I'm a pharaoh, I can answer better than that which is written in the Quran. But obviously, it's a, it's a mistake. Muhammad wrote between chapter 7 and chapter 20 a bunch of years. We know from the Sunnah of Muhammad, from the from the Hadith of Muhammad, that there were many times Muhammad did not receive any revelation for up to three years. 
Now, in these three years, when Muhammad did not receive any new verse of the Quran, he get a little bit panic. He start doubting himself. He start going up the mountain to throw himself from the top of the mountain. He's trying to commit suicide. The only prophet who commits suicide is Muhammad, or tried to commit suicide is Muhammad. And as he about to throw himself from the top of the mountain, Jibreel, oh, prophet Muhammad, you are the prophet of Allah. Oh, Muhammad, oh, thank you, Allah. Oh, I almost lost it. I almost committed suicide. And he came down. Now, imagine with me, if between chapter 7 and chapter 20, 10 years, Muhammad could not remember. So he rewrote the story with different information. That's when we see contradiction between Quran and Quran. Not just Quran and Bible, but Quran and the Quran. And don't forget, Quran chapter 4, verse 85. 4, 85. I just found it here for a minute for you, if you don't mind, sister. I know I am a little bit slow. My life is like that. I no, you're not slow at all, brother. I, I, I try to keep up. <laughs> uh, four, oh, 482. Uh, see, I was wrong. I gave you three verses late. 482. 482. The woman, verse 82. Do not, um, do they not consider the Quran? If it was from other than Allah, they would have found in it many inconsistencies. First of all, many inconsistency is a comedy. Why? Because one inconsistency makes the whole Quran go goodbye. Because Allah, all-knowing, all-wise, all does not forget, Allah should never make one mistake in his Quran. But Muhammad said, you have to be, it has to be many. Excuse me. How much is many? Is 50 mistake is enough? Is 100 mistake is enough? I promise you, in Moses' story alone, we will cover, we will discover for you at least a hundred mistakes. Okay, so let's read the question again. Do they not consider the Quran if it was from others than Allah, they would have found in it many inconsistencies. I'm glad. Thank you so much. The Quran is not from Allah. Why? Because I'm going to share with you a hundred inconsistency in that one story alone. Uh, All right. Let's keep going. Sister. Let's go. Another question that we must ask is, when did Pharaoh actually give the order for killing the sons of the Israelites? Was it when Moses was a baby or after Moses was a grown man? If this, I ask this question because in Quran 28.7, Moses was a breastfeeding baby when this took place. But in Quran 7.127-128, Moses was a grown man. That is a great contradiction. Sure. It's, it's not an easy contradiction. And don't tell me it happened twice. Because Moses, because Pharaoh said in the second request in Quran chapter one, Moses grown, I will. That means he did it. Mm, oh. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> Where did Haman come from? That's a good question. We just read it earlier. Pharaoh and Haman. I mean, I mean, if you think about this, Muhammad, Muhammad, throughout the Quran, never give us any names. He never mentioned names. The guy said one of them tells the others. The one in the men in the middle, the one on the right side, the one in the left side. You know why Muhammad said that? Because he does not know. Even in the story of Moses itself, I don't know if I'm going to cover it or not, when he said, two among them, two among them said that Allah, if Allah will, will have victory. Muhammad did not know who these two names are, but any person who's, who reads the Bible, he found, oh, two among them. Oh, he meant Joshua and Caleb. Oh, we know the Bible story. Joshua and Caleb is the only two among the spies who was sent by Moses to examine the promised land. There's only two who said we can take over the promised land. But Muhammad never mentioned names. Most stories in the Quran, no names. When Muhammad mentioned names, he always make boo-boos. He always make mistakes. So he squeezed us here for us, Haman. I'm sorry, Haman have no existence in the life of Moses. Haman have no existence in the life of the Egyptians. Muhammad made a boo-boo. We do not have anybody in Egypt by the name Haman. Not in Moses' days, not until today. I guarantee you, if you go to Egypt right now, you're not going to see a boy is named Haman. That's not an Egyptian name. That's not a Christian name. Go ahead, sister. Read. It says, another error in the preceding passage in verse 6, where Haman is mentioned within the timeline of the story of Moses as being one of the contemporary Egyptians. Haman actually served under King Ahasuerus, uh, which is Xerxes, who ruled Persia from 486 to 465 BC. That's BC. We're talking about literally 
uh, a good thousand years after Moses. Moses was wow. 1500 BC. That guy is lizard five. And so it's a thousand plus years. Different kingdom, different land, different time. Ahshawirish, we read about Ahshawirish in the Bible. This, whatever you say it in English, I don't know how you read it in English. That guy was 1,000 years before, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, uh, after Moses. So Moses has been dead. They, they already left Egypt. And we know for sure now they are because it's backwards. The number, the bigger the number, the farther away you go. So Moses came a thousand years later after Moses died. Now we hear about this, this Haman. So Quran made a thousand year mistake and different. Oh, it's all over the Quran. I mean, think about it. even Mary, the mother of Jesus. Oh, yes. She is the sister of Moses and Aaron. And that's 1500 years. Once again, different life, different place. Mary, the sister of Moses and Aaron, was born in Egypt. Mary, mm. the mother of Jesus, was actually in the land of Israel. Mm. So two different countries, two different, and 1,500 years difference. Mm. But uh, Muhammad did not too many names, so all timers, you know, mix names together, whatever. <laughs> okay. Which, by the uh, way, make Moses Jesus' uncle. Oh, how? <laughs> Yeah, oh he's, yes. <laughs> he's, he, he, he called him Amu Amu Musa. Uh, uh, he just put uh, put all the put all the characters together in one story. Uh, there's story. Way more than that on the Quran. As a matter of fact, in one passage of the Quran, he makes four stories together. As we're gonna see here, he's actually gonna confuse Moses with Jacob in the life of Moses. He's gonna confuse Moses with Jacob. I'm give you a head up here for what's coming in the near future. Our story. Go ahead, sis. Let's just see how the Quran explains Moses' survival of Pharaoh's orders. The Quran 28, 7 to 8. It is written, and we, and we reveal to Moses' mother that breastfeeds him. So when you fear for him, so cast him into the river and do not fear and do not grieve. Surely we will bring him back to you and make him of the messengers. So the family of Pharaoh picked him up so that they, he may become an enemy to them and a grief. Surely Pharaoh and Haman and their troops were Khatin. Khatin, non-Arabic word, which, which means sinners. Okay, now, um, this is how Muhammad got to the story about Moses. She, when you read, I know, I know in other passages of the Quran, he will give you more detail, but, but when you read these verses here, Quran 28, 7 and 8, she was the mother of Moses, breastfeeding her son, and if she fear for him, so she cast him into the river. Can you imagine if you read this and you don't know the Bible now? You have no clue what's written in the Bible. She breastfeed him. She got afraid. Throw him in the water. Wow. Swim, Moses. Swim, boy. You can do it. You can do it. Good boy. Good boy. Come back in. Breastfeed him again. Oh, somebody's knocking. Throw him in the water. It, it doesn't make any sense. I oh, know, no. In the Quran, we're going to read about the basket. Okay. And if you can see, you're going to explain to us the basket and the rope, which is another comedy. The whole thing about the writing of Ibn Kassir. If you are familiar with the biblical account, the true account written by the hand of Moses. And somebody may ask, wait a minute, Brother Salman. How did Moses wrote about things happen in his life when he was a baby? He was a baby. We have the agent. It's called the Holy Spirit. Not only Moses wrote about Moses when he's a baby, Moses wrote about everything happened from Adam and Eve, from creation. The Genesis account, chapter 1 and chapter 2, was written by Moses. Moses was not there. He did not see how God created Adam. But what Moses wrote about the creation of Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden and the sin and eating from the tree, all this was given to Moses by the Holy Spirit through account. He wrote to us about Noah and the flood. He wrote to us about mm -hmm. Abraham. He wrote to us about Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and the sons. And now they're in Egypt 400 years later. And now he's writing to us about himself. How did Moses know that? The Holy Spirit. God Almighty, the Holy Spirit, told Moses to write everything and he wrote it right. When you can be everything Moses wrote in the first five books of the Bible to anything written in the Quran, now you see the comedy Quran. The, the nonsensical Quran. Which, by the way, Allah assured us it is clear and it's pure Arabic, easy to understand. Well, good luck with that. All right. So, so now Moses is telling us about this, his mama, uh, uh, or Muhammad said <laughs> about Moses' mama, throw him in the river. Whenever she is fear for him. Okay. If you fear for your sons, drown him. Oh, man. <laughs> now I understand the Quran is beautiful word of Allah. It's a miracle, brother. It's a miracle. It, it must be. 
It must be it cannot swimming, be a swimming baby. And anyway, so the family affair, excuse me, excuse me. When you hear this, the family affair, Ala Fron. The entire family's sister were swimming in the river. I mean, Mr. Pharaoh and his wife and the children and the cousins, the uncle, the whole family was there. And they saw the baby in the water. Wait a minute. How did the baby win the water? I saw swim Moses. Come back, boy. Good boy. Come on. He give me a mm, love you, Moses. How in the world they found him? They picked him from the water. How does this happen? Don't worry. We're going to go to another passage of the Quran. I believe chapter 7. Uh, and we're going to read the detail. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not mocking the Quran as a fall study or full understanding. I'm mocking the Quran here. The family of Pharaoh. So which one of the family of Pharaoh picked him up? I mean, if all of them put their hands together and they picked up Moses out, man. They were afraid of the Yitran. Hurry, honey, hurry, boy, uh, come on. Uh, 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 Aziz, Aziz, uh, Ashwish, go, everybody. Go. They went all down and picked up Moses. Must, must be that way. See, Muhammad is writing to us the biblical account, and he made it his own ridiculous, nonsensical story in the Quran. And he repeated, and he repeated, and he repeated, and he had a little bit more information. Talk about the basket, and talk about the rope, which was a, the rope is invented by Ibn Kassir. And he talk about that, talk, it's nonsense. And that is a miracle of Islam. Muhammad, let me remind you again, Muhammad never opened a blind eye, but he actually picked up some good eyes out. Muhammad never healed a withered hand, but he actually cut plenty of hands. Muhammad never healed a, 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 a person who could not walk, what he calls him in English. Um, the lame. Lame. He actually cut the legs of people. Muhammad never raised somebody from the dead, but he actually killed the living. So, so Muhammad did not have the only miracle of Muhammad. Here it is. Here it is. And guess what? We're studying right now. And what do we have in it? A comedy. And we add the comedy, we add water to the muddy Quran by Muslim scholars' interpretation. And somehow, Muslims believe in Islam. The Bible said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Muslims are destroyed for foolish knowledge. All right, keep going, sister. Although the Quran does not mention a basket in these verses, Ibn Kathir's interpretation of this passage stated that Moses' family home was on the riverbank. Oh, let's stop it for a minute. You know, if I was not grown in Egypt, I, I maybe believe that this makes sense. Oh, yes, that's true. Okay, but I, I know you're laughing at me if you know about Egypt, but in reality, in reality, before the high dam of Aswan, which we built a few years ago, I don't mm -hmm. know, 56 years ago, mm -hmm. you know what happened when every year, you know what happened every year? Flood. flood. The, the Nile, the Nile goes twice as high. <laughs> I mean, if we got 20 feet, and now it's 30 feet. The water coming from uh, from Sudan, from Ethiopia, from the White and Blue River, grow, go yeah. through. I mean, Egypt by the Nile is flooded once a year. What smart Egyptian or Hebrew built a house on the edge of the river? The, the family of Pharaoh, the king, apparently. <laughs> or, or Moses' mother. She actually had... So, which means you have to rebuild your home once a year. Imagine that was me. Once a year, build a house. Wait, well, hey, the flood is coming. Get some more bricks, man. Get some, you know, and build it. It doesn't make any sense. So, the person who's writing the story of the Quran did not know the true story. That is Muhammad, Jibreel, and Allah. The person who's interpreted the Quran does not have any logic of common sense because Ibn Kassir never been in Egypt. I doubt the man even knows what he's talking about. Like Muhammad in the story of Joseph, which also took place in Egypt, he said what? There will be famine, and after that, there will be rain. Rain in Egypt? If the yeah. Egyptian people live on rain, they will be starving to death from the yeah, days yeah. of first Ramses. Second, it never, it never rains. For people who don't know, it, it, it very rarely rains in Egypt, and it floods every year. But it's okay, brother, because Moses can, can swim as a baby, so it's fine. Well, that, that's true. You see, <laughs> now, my dear sister, you, you, you're becoming a good Muslim here. Soon we're going to say the Shahada, you and I, and we'll all become good Muslims. Moses, come on, boy. Come swim. Come to mama. Come to mama. Oh, I love you. Okay, somebody else comes. Put on the water. No, it doesn't make any sense. There's nobody building a house on the edge, on the shore of the river, because they have to rebuild the house, man, every year. God helps them. God helps them. But go ahead. After board, point 11. Go ahead. His mother. Uh, his mother made a basket and tied it with a rope with which she could pull him in to breastfeed him. 
she would send him back into the river when anyone came to threaten him. <laughs> Makes sense. Aha! Yes. See? Every casino is a scholar. She wow. bought the room and the edge of the basket, tied it good. Oh, somebody's coming, mama. That's okay. Go <laughs> oh, swim. Go, go back to swim. <laughs> what? Be quiet. Slap his face, you stupid kid. Good boy. Good boy. And you, oh, is your left already gone? Okay. Boom. Press me, baby. Drink, baby. Drink, baby. Oh, good boy. Now go back to swimming. <laughs> God help us. The rope of Ibn Kasir. I call that is a rope which I'm going to be using to hang Ibn Kasir from his neck. Because guess what? Neither the Quran nor the Bible talk about rope. As a matter of fact, when Moses' mama in the Exodus account put Moses in the basket, it was to say goodbye to him, not to bring him back every three hours, four hours to breastfeed him. This is the <laughs> imagination of Ibn Kasir. Okay. Yes, but the person who threatens him, they, they can pull the rope too. <laughs> if he can swim, he can, he can go. Sorry, he doesn't <laughs> need a rope. Yeah, a good, it's a good swimmer, but after a while, go ahead. However, uh, however, the Bible records in Exodus 2 2 to 4. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood afar off to know, to know what would be done to him. Notice here the, public, the biblical account, the true writing. This is exactly what happened. The basket is made out of this reed. There's some plants we have in Egypt, pitch and, and uh, tar inside. So the water will not go inside. She's like uh, mm. sealed it from inside and put the baby. And then she put the baby uh, uh, in the middle of the reed by the bank of the, not near her house. Mm. His sister from far away standing to see what's going to happen. No that, rope. Trust me, sense. there was no rope. Go ahead, sister. Makes sense. This is where Ibn Kathir came up with the idea of a basket. However, notice that there was no rope attached to the ark and Moses' mother did not pull him back. After placing him in the ark of the river, um, she let him go. Although the Quran does not mention Moses' mother's name, Ibn Kathir stated that her name was Ayara? Ayara? Ayarka. Ayarka? Or uh, Ayaska. Ayaska. What's amazing is, why do these people make up names for characters we don't even know anywhere in the Quran? You want to you wanna hear a real name? Open the Bible. We got the real name in the Bible. Muhammad did not mention name in the Quran. Don't make up names for it. Like, remember Solomon? That's an Ibn Kasir too. The story mm -hmm. of Solomon. Maybe in the future we'll get to it. Uh, you know? And, and Solomon saw these ants. And the ants was crippled, my dear sister. So the ants, when she walked, she crippled like that. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. The and somehow, somehow, Ibn Kasir was riding on his horse. And he heard the prayer of the ants because she was crickled like this. And she, oh, Allah. It was drought. It was very drought. Oh, Allah, bring some rain on us. <laughs> Allah, please. Please. And then Allah brought rain. That's the same ant which also talked to the other ants in the Quran. Oh, ants, go to your houses. Least Solomon and his troops will crush you. And Solomon heard that and he smiled. Mm -hmm. And guess what Ibn Kasir did? He gave us a name for the ants. Yes. Sometime, my dear sister, I wish I have hair. So I can pull it out. But the problem is I don't have any hair. I can't pull my hair out. God help us. So now we've got two different names. And Ibn Kasir does not know what is the real name. The real name is Jacobet. Jacobet. And by the way, she was Moses' daddy's aunt. So uh, 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 the wonderful... Uh, uh, actually, you know what? It's coming up here. Let's read it in the next message. Go ahead. Another conflict appears in Quran 28.9. For it is reported that it was Pharaoh's wife who adopted Moses. Ibn Kathir restated this when he said that Pharaoh answered her by saying, I do not have need for him, but you have need for him. They adopted him because they did not have any sons. Wow. How did they know that? I mean, can you imagine? They got the name of the mother of, Jude, of, of Moses wrong. That's fine. Now, they know the conversation between Pharaoh and his wife. No, it was not his wife. It was his daughter. You know how many mistakes we're going to count, my dear sister? I said 100. Actually, it's going to be more than 100. I'm being so, uh, what do you call this, conservative by saying only 100. 
There are more than 100. Okay, let's go ahead. Read what he has your sister. On the other hand, the Bible teaches that it was really Pharaoh's daughter who discovered baby Moses. <coughs> In Exodus 2, 5 to 6, then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. And the maid <coughs> on the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Notice the information as it is written in the Bible. Very detailed. I don't mean, do, do you think I'm going to ask you, my dear sister in Christ, uh, would you please explain to me this person because I, I can understand it. Can, okay. can you help me out? Can you tell me what exactly the Bible is talking about here? Can you repeat it in different words? Do and the Bible you, do I need anybody to help me. No, and the Bible never says this is well detailed, well explained Bible. This yeah. is, uh, uh, you know, Hebrew or Greek. You know, it's just... It's, it's amazing. I remember, I just now remember, I used to have a friend by the name Manal. And Manal, she's from the country of Morocco. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I talked about that. I said, when you read the Quran, it's hard to understand. The information is not said. She said, no, 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 no. When you read the Bible, it looked like just any book written by some men. But to read the Quran, it's hard, which is a great evidence. It's the word of God. Because <laughs> God's level of saying is higher, much higher, much greater than men. The Bible, anybody can write a book like that. That's why anybody can understand it. But since the Quran is hard to understand, that means it is the true word of Allah. Imagine wow. this with me. If I'm going to, and I told her, and I remember my answer, I said, if I'm going to write a letter to my beloved wife, Vicky, I'm going to write to her in the Arabic language because I know she knows nothing in the Arabic language. What is the purpose of writing the letter? My wife, she's an American, okay? Can you tell me one reason why in the world I write a letter to my beloved wife in a language she can understand? Or I will write to her in the English language in, a, in an old, 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 old English, thou, thou Shakespeare writings, and my wife imagines me she does not have but simple English. What is the purpose? from God Almighty to write a book to us where we cannot understand. If you're writing a book to human, write it in human understanding so that people can understand what you're trying to tell them. Hmm. But that's not the case of my Morocco system. Okay? But that's the miracle. That's a miracle of the Quran. It's a hard book to understand. Okay, makes sense. Go ahead. Although the Quran does not give us any information of how Moses ended up in the house of Pharaoh, Muhammad gave us more details concerning the women who tried to breastfeed Moses and how he would not take any of their milk. Surprisingly, the sister of Moses appeared on the scene, asking them if they if she could provide a house in which to take care of Moses. And that is how Allah returned Moses back to his own mother, for her heart was broken from losing her son. Oh, oh, oh. I can't imagine how she went through this <laughs> rough time, losing her baby for all these months. But here's the deal. Ibn Kassir gave us the detail as, listen carefully, as if he was there in the market. I'm not kidding you. When you read what Ibn Kassir is writing in any of his interpretation to many of the verses of the Quran, not just Moses, any other stories, you think, wait a minute, was he a prophet? No. Did Allah reveal to him? No. Was he there? No. How did he know that? So they said, Pharaoh's wife, she went to the market because she knew there's a lot of women there. And the baby was crying and crying and crying. And they figured out he's crying because he's hungry. Okay, come here to feed the feed, Press feed the baby. And she, ah, ah, she went away. Okay, come here, Nancy. Nancy, press feed the baby. She put him across her breast. Ah, ah, and he refused to take milk from any of these women. But later, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, how great Allah is. Okay. When his mama hold him, he just suckled her and finished all the milk in her breast like that. <laughs> and he got big. Can you imagine that? How did Ibn Kassir know that? Was he there? Did he saw it? The details of Ibn Kassir in his interpretation supersedes the entire Quran of its knowledge. I mean, Ibn Kassir is much better than Allah and Muhammad and Jibreel. When I read Ibn Kassir's interpretation, I don't need to worry about what he actually meant because I understood it. But when I read the Quran, I couldn't understand what Allah is saying. But worse than that, sometimes even Kassir interpret, as I said earlier, verses does not exist in the Quran, which means he's actually fabricating. Hermeneutics means nothing to the Muslims. Let's, let me say this quote again. When you talk about hermeneutics, which is the science of interpretation, number one, 
you read what the author said, what Muhammad or Moses or Abraham, whatever said, okay? You have to find out what did he meant by what he said? What did he meant by what he said, but not by your imagination, by what he said? How did the author understood these verses? How did the author practice these verses? How did the author followers, the people around him, live and practice these verses? And then bring that verses to our culture time today to have a true practice and belief of that verse. I'm sorry, Ibn Kassir have zero hermeneutics. He have no clue what he's writing in his interpretation. But somehow Muslim love him and somehow he's a scholar. If Ibn Kassir would bring his interpretation to any of the verses of the Quran in any college in, in America today, he would get a big fat F. Which means, where do you come up with this? Hmm. All right, go ahead, sister. This can be found in Quran 28, 10 to 13. And the heart of Moses' mother became empty, that she almost exposed him, were it not that we tied on her heart that she will be of she the was almost exposed him. Just, just think about that verse. What she's going to expose him? She's going to go tell him, that's my son? Hmm. See, this is made up. Because when we read the Bible, as we read in Exodus 2, 5, 6, we know that Pharaoh's daughter, no, it's like one of the, who in the Egyptian mind will put his son into the river? <laughs> who is killing Egyptian children? Maybe he was a Spanish boy. Maybe he was from America. Of course he's a Hebrew. What is he going to expose? But Muhammad needs to make his poetry of the Quran so he can have the story, so he can have the miracle of Islam, the Quran. Go ahead. So what happened next verse? So, um, yes, and, and, she said to his sister, and she said to his sister, follow him. So she watched him from alongside, and they did not feel. And we forbid him the breastfeeding from other women before that. So she said, will I point out to you the family to, of a house who will take care of him for you, and they will be an advisor to him? So we returned him to his mother, so her eyes may be pleased, and she will not grieve. And she might know that the promise of Allah is true. But most of them do not know. Promise of Allah is true? You mean Allah talked to her? Was the mama of Moses a prophetess? I mean, mm. how did she know the promise of Allah? When you read the Bible, God did not tell her anything. Moses' mama did not have a clue that she would see that boy again. Hmm. In the Quran, somehow she's a prophet. She's talked to Allah and Allah promised her and the promise Allah has fulfilled. Who made that? Who made this up? Who made this up? When Moses' sister Mary or Maryam, she was watching from far away and nobody feel secret? No. She's standing, a girl by the river. She just wondered what is going to happen to her brother boy. Is anybody pick him up? Is gonna be somebody going to feed him? Not that Allah revealed to her mama that he's going to bring his boy back. This is not. Biblical is not even chronicle, which means we don't have a prophet woman in Islam. Keep going. That's true, actually. And um, also, it says we can advise him. He's a baby. <laughs> maybe remember, he was advised when he's 40 years old. Moses, <laughs> people. Maybe, maybe this happened when Moses was 40 years old. Maybe. I don't know. She put him in a bigger basket. Okay, go ahead. Do you remember, brother, when you told me and um, Sister Hatun about the babies that were born in Islam with like teeth and they were born that they can eat? It's you true. Know, it years. Depend, sister, sister, depend on how long the baby yes. is stayed in the mother womb. If the baby is born nine months, no teeth. If the baby four years, big teeth. Ten years, teeth and a little bit mustache and beard. Okay? Mm. Go ahead. Okay, so... <laughs> here's, here's another good point. The school of thoughts in Islam, and when I hear Muslims in America talk about the school of thoughts in Islam, the Hanafi, the Hanbali, the, 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 excuse me, excuse me, what school of thoughts? To add the word schools to these people make you stupid. Because school, in my mind, when I hear the word school, my dear sister, I think of education, I think of knowledge, I think of science. I think of facts. I think of truth. These schools saw disagree on the number discovers this Shafi and Hanbali and all these wonderful people. They disagree about they disagree about the number of months a baby or years a baby can be inside the mother womb. If the American people know that these school of thoughts authors, these great Muslim 
uh, educator believe a mama can be pregnant three years, four years, five years, or even up to 10. Here's the school of thought. We could laugh at the Muslim school of thoughts, but mm. they don't tell the American people the whole truth. Well, you know, we have different uh, uh, beliefs according to our school of thoughts, you know. Uh, school of thoughts, throw your school of thought to a garbage can. <laughs> if somebody teaching a school, a mama can be pregnant, the least, the least is six months, makes sense. Or three years, normally all these scholars in their education believe three years is normal. Or five, or ten. You tell this American people, you will kiss Islam goodbye. Because your scholars are dumbers, and your school of Scott, a school, a school of comedy. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, sorry, I keep um, missing where I am. Um, no, I Ibn Kathir. Um, today. <laughs> Ibn Kathir stated that a family of Pharaoh gave Moses to his sister and went with them to their home. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the order. They gave the baby to the sister, and they went. Let's go visit Moses. Uh, that uh, family of the of the Hebrews is this what happened in the Bible? No, no, not at all. In the Bible, she went. She get her mama. She talked to Pharaoh's daughter. She breastfeed this baby, and I'll pay you for it. Pharaoh's daughter did not go to some Hebrews' home to check on the house. But go ahead, keep reading, sister. It's like they're one happy family, brother. Yeah, must be, must be. When his mother held him to breastfeed, he suckled from her, and they all rejoiced with a great joy. <laughs> and they rejoice with a great exceeding joy. That's a song in, in America, a Christmas song. They rejoice with a great exceeding joy. What a comedy. What a comedy. My question is, as always, where did Ibn Kassir come up with this information? Man, if you look at this statement in my book, if you download my uh, Quran as an e-book and look for where did Ibn Kassir come up with this information, you get, I don't know, maybe a thousand times. Because Ibn Kassir is just making up stuff. I mean, can you interpret a verse that does not exist in the Quran? How can you interpret? This is not interpretation, my dear friends. Once again, fabrication, which means fairy tales. Go ahead. The preceding Quran verses and interpretations conflict with the following passage in Quran 20. Verse Wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that the Quran contradicts the Quran? Yes, all the time. All, all the time. Oh, okay. When Allah spoke to Moses, and indeed we put on you a favor another time, when we reveal to your mother what is revealed. Okay, that here we go. Notice here, notice here, verse 38. She was a prophetess. Yeah, amazing. Allah revealed to her. When in reality, in the Bible, God did not reveal to her anything. She had no clue. She was just get rid of the baby. Well, in Islam, in Islam, you don't have women prophets. Women prophets. is dirtier than dirt. Okay, how can how can you make a woman a prophet if there if a man touch a woman and he could not find water to wash his hand, he rub his hand and face with dirt, but it have to be good dirt. Means uh, loose dirt, no poopy or camel pee pee in it, or no. And that's how Muslim men become clean. How do you expect Allah to reveal to a woman if a man touch her? He need to get clean, not with shampoo or soap. No, with water. No, with dirt. Mm. Go ahead. She, and she can break when she passes. She breaks his prayer. <laughs> That's true. Prophet. Yeah. So, um, cast him into the ark. So he revealed to Moses' mom, cast him into the ark. So she, so cast him into the river. So the river will cast him to the shore. An enemy to me and an enemy to him will take him. And I will bestow love on you <coughs> from me. And you will be made before my eyes. So Allah told Moses' mom exactly what's going to happen. That is called revelation. That is called prophecy. Telling the future. You put him in the ark, put the ark in the river, the river will take him to the Pharaoh's wife, she will pick him up, will bring him back to you. If that's the case, why her heart was broken? We read earlier. I mean, she almost exposed him. She's like, That's my baby, that's my boy. Please bring him back to me. I beg you, let me have my boy back. She was almost gonna expose him. If she is a prophetess, and Allah revealed that to her, she should. Put him in the river, and she starts drinking coffee and enjoy her love, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. She's happy because she is a prophet. She believes in Allah, and Allah bring him back to her. She knows a day or a month later, she's going to have him back anyway. Does this make any sense to you, my, to you, my dear sister? No, it's... If, they Allah, if, yeah. 
what I'm saying, if what we read in chapter 20, verses 37 to 39, is true. Allah revealed to his mama, this is going to happen, A, B, C, D, E. Why? In the other passage, which we read in Quran, chapter 28, she's almost going to give him away. She's going to tell the whole world, that's my boy. She didn't believe Allah's promise. That's a contradiction. See, what between chapter 28 and chapter 20, I don't know, five years, seven years, Muhammad could not remember. We have another expression in Egypt. It's called Al-Kazab Nasai. Okay? The liar is forgetful. If I'm making up a story to Sister Hatun, Sister Hatun, I did this and I did this and I did that. Okay, she had good memory, she wrote it down. Wait, wait, four or five years later. Oh, Hatun, I did this and this and those and that. Now exaggerate. Now I lie because I forgot what I said earlier. Trust me, if what I said to Hatun first time is true, it doesn't matter if I repeat it 10 times in 20 years. It's always be the same. When you lie, you forget. And that is the story of the Quran. Why Muhammad never put the Quran in written form? Why did Muhammad die before with the Muslim have? I mean, who is Satan? Which prophet who came before Muhammad died before he wrote what information, what revelation God is giving to him? Give me a name of a prophet who died without having his book written in form. In a, his, his, his message, his revelation in a book form. Give me a name of one. Not even one. So the final one, the most smart one, the best of the best die without having a written Quran. You know why? Because he does not want people to catch him by his, his own lies. I don't want anybody to record my teaching if I'm lying. Because guess what? I'm going to lie and I guess, oh, you somehow said here this. You somehow said here said. You somehow is lying. He's contradicting himself. And that's a problem. That's one reason why Muhammad never asked the people to write the Quran while he's still alive until he died. So you don't catch his lies. Okay, go ahead, sister. And then you mentioned here, brother, did the basket have a rope? Did Moses' mother pull him into breastfeed and push him back into the river when danger was present? Or was he set loose upon the river and then washed ashore, as in the Quran 20, verse 39? That's true. So the rope disappeared in this in this story. Not just this. Actually, my Ibn Kasir, I don't know if I wrote it or not. I can't remember everything I wrote. But Ibn Kasir stated that the rope got loose from her hand. He got distracted and the baby gone. But then if, you... if that is the case, if that's the case, so how can Allah tell her in that verse that she put him in the river? Yeah, and the river she... will be going to go somewhere else. If she believed Allah, she shouldn't need the rope. But see, they're making up stuff, my dear sister. That's the whole idea. They are fabricating a story for Moses so the Muslims believe in Moses with his story. That's all. That's all. She was standing there with a baby and a rope crying and breastfeeding and no Egyptian saw anything, no one... Stopped anything, <laughs> but because the house was on the top of the bank of the river, so nobody can see it. Or swim, boy, come oh, here, come oh, here, oh, Moses. Oh, Moses. Oh, Moses. Love you, buddy. Come here, give me a hug. Okay. <laughs> swim, Moses. Swim. Exodus two four to ten gives the original true account. Many of the Bible passages referred to this in this section on Moses will be summarized and paraphrased. The reader is encouraged to read those Bible passages in their entire It's very important you read that because I don't want people to read what I wrote here and say, oh, Yusama is, come, is, is, uh, is uh, fabricating a Bible. Yusama is uh, contradicting the Bible. I'm just paraphrasing it to make it easy for the readers. And because of the copyright, we have a limited how many verses we can put in our book. My book is loaded. Look at this. Two big books. 41 chapter. Uh, if, and if I will write everything exactly, that book will be four books. But to make it simple, I just paraphrase some of the passages. And I always encourage you, my wonderful readers, if you're watching this right now, or you have this Exodus 2, to, uh, chapter 2, 4 to 10, please read the previous chapter and the rest of the book of Exodus. Please read the Bible and read the Quran. Go ahead. According to verses 4 to 10, the sister of a baby boy who at this point had been placed in a basket and hidden in the reeds on the river, watched to see what would happen to him. When the pharaoh's daughter came to the river to bathe, she saw the basket and sent her maid to retrieve it and bring it to her. When she opened the basket, she saw the baby. The pharaoh's daughter realized that it was one of the Hebrew children, yet she had compassion on him. Then the sister of the child asked pharaoh's daughter if she could find a nurse for this child. Pharaoh's daughter told her to do so. The girl brought the baby's own mother to Pharaoh's daughter. Who Notice told... here, Pharaoh's daughter did not go to the mama. The mama came to Pharaoh's daughter. Yes. 
logic, common sense. If 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 we if we if we just even think about the culture setting, Pharaoh's daughter did not go to some Hebrews slave's house. Mm. Yes. The um yes. So and and told her that she would pay her to do so. So the mother took her own baby home and nursed him. When he grew, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, where he became her son. Then Pharaoh's daughter named him Moses, which means because I drew him out of the water. That's the word Musa, lift of the water, picking up from the water. Biblical name fits with the story. Mm. All these Hebrew names in the Quran, in the Arabic Quran. <laughs> um, when we read the story in the Quran, several women try to breastfeed Moses. However, in the biblical account, it was his mother alone that breastfed him. There's no reason to go to the market and try all the ladies who have more milk than the other and who have sweeter milk than the other so we can breastfeed the baby. Uh, somehow, somehow, Muhammad has something to do with the breastfeeding of babies. Remember that? Aisha, radiallahu anha, she said, uh, give me just a minute here. I look, let me give you the reference. Aisha, yeah. radiallahu anha, said, it was among that which is written in the Quran. They love that subject of breastfeeding for some reason. <laughs> okay, let me let me give you the summary of it. I actually said it was among that which was written in the Quran. A ten breastfeeding will forbid the baby from marry the sister from the same mama who breastfeed her or him. And it was nusikhat, it was abrogated by five times. So if a mom breastfeed a baby, he's not hers, ten times, when that baby grew up to be a man, cannot marry her own daughter. Why? Because they are brother and sister in the breastfeeding. And that verse was abrogated, canceled, erased, deleted, replaced by five times, only five times. Now, if my wife breastfeed my son, and breastfeed our neighbor daughter five times. When she grew up, that daughter, she cannot be married to my son. And what happened these verses? They're no longer in the Quran. They're gone. They disappeared. And what a logic here. What if a mama, two moms, have two children to drink from the same cow milk, not five times or ten times, for five years or for ten years, until the cow got real old and died. And then they ate its meat. Now, can these two children marry to each other? No, the cow is become the cow becomes the mother. The cow becomes the <laughs> <laughs> You're killing me, smalls. Okay, move on. So I got Sister Hatun here saying, Is it okay with you, brother, to do the next chapter? The killing I will of stop the Egyptian anytime. Egyptian. I can go for another two hours, but we can stop here. The killing of the Egyptian. That's a good place to stop. If you don't mind, color it like that and leave it car like that. Because between here and next week, I will not remember where I was. I'm getting old, all right? But uh, first of all, thank you so much for spending this time with me and do some of this reading and have this wonderful conversation. And I pray that the Lord will continue to bless you and Sister Hatun and bless all our wonderful audience. And I pray that the Lord will help our dear Muslim friends not to take it personal that we are here. Oh, they're mocking the Quran. They're insulting Allah. They're insulting Muhammad. They're blasphemers. No, 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 please, please. Hear my heart. I love you. You know what is going to cost me in the future of doing that? I'm going to be, be super rich. I'm going to be a millionaire. No, I'll be killed by a hand of most likely some Muslim like you. I'm not doing this for, shame, for uh, fame or because to put shame on you. What we're doing here is very simple. We're reading a story in the Quran. You believe that the Quran is a perfect word of Allah. Why? Because the Quran talk about Muhammad. No, 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 no. Because the Quran talk about Adam and Abraham and Moses and Noah and, and Joseph and all these stories and David and Solomon. But in reality, if you examine the Quran, study the Quran, ask questions, literally go, so, go through all what we did here today and last week and next week, Lord's willing, until we finish Moses, go through it many times, take notes. Examine what we're teaching you. If you find what we teach is a lie, then stay Muslim. But if you find what we teach does, does not make any sense concerning Islam, and it, the truth is in the Exodus account written by the hand of Moses, maybe it's time for you to say goodbye, Allah, goodbye, Muhammad, goodbye, Jibreel. I don't need you anymore. Set yourself free. 
You will never leave Islam unless you know for sure that Islam is falsehood. And you will never know Islam is a falsehood unless you study Islam, as, unless you study the Quran. Don't take my word for it. Examine everything we're saying. My heart desire is somehow some Muslim will write to Sister Hatun in the future or write to me say, Brother Usama, I left Islam because I now investigating the Quran and I found it's not a miracle, it's a comedy. Mm. And, and, and another very important fact, if the life of Muhammad is worthy to be followed, I would say, hey, somebody change the Bible. That Moses story in the Genesis account and Exodus account and Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers, these are made up stuff. Why? Because Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, the man who lived perfect life, he was holy, he was righteous, and he will not lie to us. No, let's examine Muhammad, the source of the Quran. A child molester, a sex offender, a prophet pretender, a womanizer, an adulterer, a thief, a thug, a terrorist. Not because I said so, because the Quran said so. A book you did not study yet. Because the Sunnah of Muhammad said so. The bibliography written by your own scholar, Ibn Hisham or, or others, they all said so. Muhammad was not that holy, righteous man to follow. A simple, wicked man. His book is empty. We wait, we find it, it's, it's missing. It's missing everything. So my, I hope and I pray that you guys continue to uh, join us again for the next broadcast and continue to examine everything and teach. And with all mean, usama at thestraightway.org. Usama at thestraightway.org. Write to me. Usama, you did mistake here. You, you lied here. That's not what the Quran says. That's not what Muhammad said. That's not what Ibn Kassir said. You just made a mistake. And you know what? Next Saturday, next, next Monday, or whenever we meet again, depending on Sister Hatun with her schedule, when we meet again, I will apologize. I will start our program by apologizing about my falsehood and the mistakes. And the, trust me, if you find a mistake in my teaching, it's going to be an honest mistake. And I will not repeat my lie again or my mistake again for the next study when I repeat the study with tons of people in different languages around the world. All right? Keep me in your prayer. Appreciate you. And uh, I don't know if Sister Hatun can play for us our closing video. It's powerful because that video, it is the answer for this study. The study is not to make fun of Islam, Allah, Muhammad, Jibreel, and the Quran. The study is for you to examine your heart, to know that you needed Christ. You need Christ as Lord and Savior, and only Christ can set you free. So I hope if we can play that video, Sister Hatun, people can get saved through the end of it. If not, we'll do it next time. I'm not sure. It astounds me that people who are going to buy a new stereo system or a new automobile or a refrigerator will spend a great deal of time reading the magazines, looking into the consumer reports, and selecting the very best one for the money. But when it comes to their eternal souls, they flippantly say, well, everybody has their own belief, you know. When I went to university, there would be people who would ask me, you're a Christian? Yes. Your parents were Christians? Yes. Ah, that explains it. You're a Christian because your parents were Christians. If they were Hindu. But that's really the question, you know. The question is, if I were able to line up all the belief systems in the world and prod them and poke them and turn them on and try them out, then what would I be? One day, a famous preacher in America, Harry Arnside, was preaching on the streets. A passerby interrupted him and said, excuse me, sir, how do you expect an ordinary man like me to figure out the right way? There are thousands of beliefs in the world. Harry Ironside said, sir, thousands of beliefs? I only know of two. <laughs> said the man, there's Buddhism and Confucianism and Hinduism and Islam and all the isms of Christendom. What do you mean only two beliefs? Ironside said, there are those who believe they can save themselves and those who believe they need a save. All of the religions of basically tell you there's something you need to do to save yourself. But the message of Christianity is unique in this, that it proclaims to men and women a savior. There are many people who say, well, the Bible is just another holy book. They're all pretty much the same. Now, people who say that haven't done their homework. 
What God did for us so that we could authenticate the message of Jesus as he came into the world was before ever he came, hundreds of years before he came, to paint a portrait in words that would exactly describe him when he did come. One prophet said that he was going to be betrayed and you would assume that his betrayal would be done by his enemies. No, said another prophet, You would presume that if he was betrayed by the Jews, that he would be executed by stoning. That was the traditional form of execution by the Jews. You remember they did it with Stephen. They tried to do it with Paul. No, says another prophet, they will pierce his hands and his feet. In fact, the description of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, written about a thousand years before it happened, describes his crucifixion more than 700 years before crucifixion was invented. You would assume that if a man was to be sold for a price, according to Jewish law, a man would be sold for 50 pieces of silver. No, said the scripture. He will be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Now, isn't that an astounding fact? The very people who were trying to disprove his messiahship knew that And what had to do to disqualify him from being the Messiah was pay 31 pieces of silver and he wouldn't have been the Messiah. And they paid 30 pieces of silver and sealed the amount of money in the public record. Where would the Messiah be born? Where would he come from? Matthew quotes first of all that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem Judah. So said Micah chapter 5 verse 2, perhaps 750, 800 years before the Lord Jesus came, Messiah would be born in Bethlehem Judah. You arrange the town you're born in. You try to arrange the family you're born to. I suggest it would be a bit tough to do. But you see, that's not the extent of it. Because as I pointed out, it was those who did not want him to look like the Messiah who paid the 30 pieces of silver. By that. I've given you fulfilled prophecies. There are over 300 of them. Now, my friend, you've got to do something with that. <laughs> you can ignore it. But if you examine the Word of God, you will discover that unlike any other religion in the world, God has taken your brain seriously, and he has given you hard evidence to believe that Jesus has proven himself to be the Messiah, the Son of God, and declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Christianity is the only belief system in the world that gives you evidence in history to authenticate its truthfulness. But there's more. Some people think that if they do good in certain situations, to overcome the bad things they've done. Some people say, well, I think I'm a pretty good person. Listen, you don't even come up to your own standards, let alone God's. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, in other words, by seeking to live a good life and keep the Ten Commandments, live by the golden rule, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Everybody falls short of God's standard. No matter how wicked a sinner you are, no matter how good you think you are, God has made an offer to the human race. To those who find the way barred, because their own sin and failure has kept them from meeting God's standard, there is an alternative. It is the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all those who believe for all. Christianity is the only belief system in the world that lets you be honest with God about your sin. You ask someone who's trying to get to heaven by the good works, how are you doing? Oh, not bad. Oh, really? <laughs> not bad, huh? Oh, doing pretty good. Doing my best. Oh, you are. I've never met anybody who does their best, even by their own standards. 
God doesn't ask you to pretend you're okay. He wants you to be honest with him. Now listen carefully. And you may not believe me at first, but it's true. Christianity is the only belief system in the world that offers a savior. Islam doesn't offer a savior. Islam says save yourself. It's a do-it-yourself religion. And all the religions of the world fall under the same category. If you do it well enough, you'll get to heaven. And as long as you think you can save yourself, any religion will do. But when you find out you need a savior, the list is very short. There's only one, and his name is Jesus. Now, save yourself is an absolutely ludicrous statement. If you're in a burning building and you're screaming out the window, help, save me, save me, and I'm walking by and I say, ah, save yourself. <laughs> Listen, if you can save yourself, you don't need to be saved. You can't save yourself. When Christ died on the cross, he paid the debt you owed. And in exchange for your sin, taking your sin, he has offered you his rightness, his righteousness as a gift, a free exchange. Salvation is not something you earn. Salvation Every other religion ultimately says that when you stand before God, you're desperately hoping that he's going to uh, fudge a bit to let you into heaven. There's no follower of any religion that says, when I stand before God someday, I'm going to say to him, okay, God, here's your challenge. Put my life up on this side, put your law on that side, and I challenge you to find one thing wrong with my life. Is that what people are going to say? Oh, no. They're hoping against hope that somehow they're going to slip in, maybe in the top half percent, you know. Maybe they're going to get in if God won't be too careful at looking at their life. However, can I expect to get into heaven? Oh, says God, here's what we'll do. I'll account your debt to my son. He'll pay it in full. So God sets the standard. God hands over the bill, and then he pays it himself. Examine the evidence. Not only the evidence in the Bible, the evidence in your own heart that you're a sinner and you need a savior, and you can't save yourself. And then read what the Bible has to say about the Lord Jesus, the Savior of sinners, he came to save you. And if you will, as the Bible declares, be honest with God about your sin. That's what the Bible calls repentance. And receive the Lord Jesus as the Savior of sinners. Say, oh God, I don't know why you'd want me. I'm damaged goods. But you said that whoever came to you, you would in no wise cast out. Take me now, save me now. I give up. I'll accept the gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you all for joining us and um, special thanks to our, our brother Osama Doctor for coming in and uh, always giving us great information and uh, always fun to have him. We hope to have him one um, more uh, for the future to go through the um, remaining parts of Moses uh, in Islam uh, as opposed to the true story of Moses in the Bible. Until then, thank you all and God bless you.